All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us during the Lithum Partners Winter 2021 Investor Conference and what we are calling our 2022 Vision Event. My name is Robert Bloom, Managing <coughs> Partner of Lithum Partners, and during this fireside chat, we welcome Sinestech, ticker symbol of SNES on the NASDAQ, and their Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Ken Siegel, and Chief Financial Officer, Tom Shesterman. We'll dive into questions in just a moment, but I want to remind everyone that Sinestech will be available for one-on-one -on -one meetings later this week. If you've not already signed up, please send me an email at bloom, B-L-U-M, at lithumpartners.com, or you can visit our website at lithumpartners.com forward slash virtual, click on the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button, and we'll get you taken care of. So with that, let's begin. You know, maybe Ken, start with a a uh, brief overview of the company and, and maybe a little bit of your background as well. And we'll let you to SNES Tech. Sure, Robert. Um, as my colleague Tom likes to say, we uh, we sell rodent birth control. And, um, you know, once you get past the, you know, the, the slightly amused notion of that, what we really have is a radical new technology that is substantially transforming the pest control industry. And what we've done is we've moved from, you know, the traditional means that have been going on literally for decades, if not centuries, of how to control rats uh, through poison, through other lethal means, to getting to the root cause of the problem, and that is uh, how fast rats reproduce. Rats actually, a base pair of rats is responsible for about 15,000 descendants in the course of a single year, which is roughly their, their lifetime in the wild. And frankly, the reason why existing technologies don't work or don't work well is because you can't kill them fast enough. You can't get rid of them fast enough to offset that incredible birth rate. And so our technology, which is embodied in a product called ContraPest, deals with that fundamental issue. It deals with rat reproduction. And the good news is it deals with it in a much more sustainable and non-toxic way. So as opposed to spreading poison around the planet, opposed to having issues with uh, secondary species poisoning, many people have seen all the issues around poison cats, poison dogs, uh, raptors, in particular the cougars in California. Essentially what happens is we have a product that a rat consumes, does not change the rat's behavior. Uh, the rat is no longer capable of reproducing. And if it's preyed upon by a... Uh, another animal, or if another animal gets it and, and consumes the product, it's metabolized so quickly that it has minimal effect. So the reason that, uh, you know, I got attracted to this, Robert, actually, which gets into my background is, you know, it may sound strange to people, but I started out in the hotel business, in the hospitality industry, and most recently I was the CEO of a timeshare company. But one of the things that we had learned, uh, particularly back when I was with Starwood Hotels, is... Um, you know, a key to, to success in, in a state industry, you know, hospitality has literally been doing things for a couple of thousand years, um, is creativity, it's disruption. And in, you know, in, in Starwood, for example, we reinvented the bed in 1999. And you sit there and you go, that, that's somewhat amusing to think about it. But literally, in that particular space, no one had thought that a guest actually wanted to stay in a bed that was comfortable, but also looked extraordinarily clean, okay? White bedding, crisp cotton sheets. And in a relatively short period of time, transformed the industry, moved it from, you know, this routine, you know, head and bed uh, type of mindset to it's an experiential thing, it's comfort, it's... Um, you know, it, it's a much more comprehensive experience than <clears throat> the industry uh, was accustomed to. And Starwood literally took off from that brief moment. You know, similarly speaking, um, you know, ContraPest is a novel idea, but something that has literally been, you know, centuries in the making. And we are absolutely now able to transform an industry with something that makes an incredible amount of sense, that's incredibly powerful, um, and that um, and that above all works. The other thing that um, you know attracted to me uh, to it was you know again coming from the old industry is 
we became acutely focused on on issues of sustainability, how it is that a company could become much less um, impactful on the planet, how our, our presence there could actually be positive. And if you look at it, you get to Contrabest, you get to Synestec, you have a highly disruptive product and you have something that is incredibly powerful and effective from a sustainability standpoint. And for me, it was just a natural transition uh, you know, to something that I'm very passionate and very excited about. So you've talked about going into a couple of different end markets, and I want to sort of go into each one of these individually. And let's start first with municipalities, right? Uh, talk about your traction with Contrapest in this market, and maybe give us some examples of various deployments that have been made. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been interesting, Robert. You know, one of the things that we were concerned about, you know, we've really only been commercializing the product for less than two years is you have a dynamic in the municipalities in which the sales cycle is relatively long and relatively slow because you have to make sure that you get into the annual budgeting. And so you could be one to two years from the time of initial contact to when you could actually receive an order. We've had a couple of things break our way which seem to be accelerating the process. The first of which is a change in the law in California which essentially has started to ban the use of a lot of the poisons, the rodenticides that I was talking about earlier. So there's now a, a, a natural inclination, if not a requirement in California municipalities and other applications to begin to find alternatives and contrapest obviously is a compelling alternative. So we've started to see some significant attraction in the California market, uh, which has been able to give us um, you know, word of mouth, it's been able to give us various, you know, experiences we can talk to and give us some, you know, reasonable revenue, particularly in the major cities. At the same time, we, you know, launched a multi-year uh, prototype project in Washington, D.C. to demonstrate just how effective Contrapest could be. And in Washington, D.C., and deployments across, you know, all of their wards, but, you know, with key emphasis on, uh, on two, we were able to achieve a north than 90% reduction in the rodent populations. And that's on top of their existing protocols. That's on top of the use of poisons. That's on the top of use of exclusions, et cetera. So literally taking what everybody else was capable of doing and reducing it another 90%. The other issue though, and what's critical is in pre-existing technologies, you always have the issue of rebound. Literally, you can knock the population down, but because of what I was talking about in the reproduction rate, the population comes back in three to six months. When you use contrapest because you're controlling reproduction, the population does not bounce back. So after a year of deployment, that 90% plus reduction in Washington was continued to be sustained. So what's happened there is you have the experience in California, you have the experience in Washington, and we're beginning to see traction. So suddenly, and not so suddenly, I mean, obviously our sales team was working hard on this. We began to see penetration in the Northeast. And so we had a successful deployment in Hartford. Uh, that actually, through um, not only word of mouth, but PR coverage, et cetera, has begun to cascade throughout the New England region. And so what we're starting to see in municipalities is, you know, the two-year sales cycle now that we have experience under our belt in various municipalities, have other municipalities now calling us, not only municipalities themselves, but homeowners associations, community associations going, how do we begin to look at this product? How do we begin to deploy it? And so, you know, it, the, the traction has started to manifest itself. Now we're looking forward to seeing whether we can continue to accelerate it. Let's next transition to, your, to, to additional business uh, verticals here. Agribusiness is one that you've uh, uh, really gone after here. Uh, you talked about the budget cycles within municipalities. I assume it's a completely different sort of a process within uh, agricultural. What are the issues that agricultural uh, customers are, are looking to address and, and what's the value proposition of what they're looking for versus a municipality, for instance? Yeah, I mean, a great question. So. In municipalities, you know, again, I, you know, Tom seems to have more of the sense of humor than I do, but municipalities, essentially, they look at it as one rat, one vote. 
for food and agriculture, it is a, it's an economic issue, but it's also a regulatory issue. If you end up with a rodent infestation, you're going to have serious issues with, you know, with the regulators and the possible risk of, you know, shutting down your facilities. But rats, particularly in ag, and where we started was looking at poultry, because, you know, and I'll explain that in a moment. Not only is it an issue of consuming the agricultural product, whether that's grain or it's predation on chickens, et cetera, they contaminate far more than they actually consume. So you're looking at a, an iterative effect, if not an order of magnitude effect of the damage they cause. And you also look at it from the standpoint of infrastructure damage. I mean, rats are extraordinarily destructive. So they're destroying crates, they're destroying pallets, they're destroying barn walls, they're destroying electrical equipment, all sorts of different things. So there's a very significant economic effect, you know, across the entire operation in a farming or agricultural unit. What we decided to focus on initially is grain. And, you know, grain essentially is a vector across the entire food chain, if you will. And where we started initially was looking at the poultry market. And again, for these various reasons of how many different effects a rat infestation can cause in poultry. And similar to what I talked about in, in DC, in our poultry deployments, we were again able to achieve nearly a 98% reduction in the rodent populations. And so you're, you're looking at it, just a dramatic change from what they've normally been able to experience. And you look at it, you know, an average in the, the areas we study, a $5,000 investment in contrapest during the course of a year dropped about $600,000 to the bottom line of, a, of an individual bar, you know, bar and an individual farming operation. So looking at it as an extraordinary rate of return on the product. Um, in, in the case of food and agriculture, it's, it's efficacy. Okay, it's cost, it's the need to deploy. From our vantage point, the critical issue for us, uh, you know, which we've finally recently solved, is getting their awareness, getting their attention, and figuring out who it is to talk to. And so you think about it in terms of the big corporate farms, the big factory farms, et cetera, getting to the decision maker was the historic problem for us. And you know, we think we finally cracked that with, um, with database access that we now have that give us actually down to the individual barn, the individual silo, who controls that particular operation. Now we started now with email and social campaigns. And now that, you know, in sort of, as we're heading into the post COVID world, the ability to get our salespeople out and actually knocking on doors we think that not only do we have the proven results of the product, we have the data showing it, but we now have the knowledge of who it is we need to go speak to and who it is we need to go talk to. That really has only started in the past couple of months, uh, but we're looking forward to you know significant traction on that going into 2022. All right. Um, let's go next to zoos and sanctuaries, another segment that you've talked uh, quite a bit about. And I would guess given the nature of the product, uh, it's a very logical end market. Um, talk about this market a little bit. Talk about how ContraPest fits and does it tie into some of the other markets out there? Yeah, I mean, zoos and, fat and sanctuaries has been actually a very interesting experience for us because in some respects, I think it's become the template for what we think can happen in the other markets. It's a smaller market. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, there's some level of economic constraint in, uh, in budgeting, but you have a, a target market, a constituency that is highly sensitive to the issues that ContraPest helps alleviate. So obviously, when you're worried about other species, you know, and, and <clears throat> as a sanctuary or a zoo, your key focus is on multiple species. You don't want to be deploying poisons. There's just too high a risk to the other animals as you attempt to control rats. So we have a, a natural entree there. The critical issue was demonstrating efficacy. And we started out with a you know, limited number of initial zoo and sanctuary targets. 
And what's happened is given the success that we've now had in the, in the initial locations, you can begin to see the word of mouth, you can begin to see the awareness expanding and we're finding the sales are much quicker. We're finding that now they're reaching out directly to us, uh, calling us about deployments <clears throat> and we're rapidly penetrating that market. And so <clears throat> other pieces associated with it, it's also beginning to spawn submarkets. So one of the things that we've learned recently is an analog to zoos and sanctuaries is the equestrian market. Uh, you know, whether it's horse racing or it's all the various different, you know, activities that you can have with horses, highly sensitive uh, to rodent issues. I mean, rats are extraordinarily prevalent around horses. Again, enormous sensitivity to exposing these animals to poison. And so now all, uh, all of a sudden we're beginning to see growing interest in that segment, uh, largely as a result of the work we did in zoos and sanctuaries. But similarly, as you can see it, we had, you know, we, we were able to penetrate a small portion of the market initially, demonstrate success. You start to see word of mouth, you start to see acceptance, and then you begin to see an accelerated penetration in that market. And frankly, we don't see any difference between that and the other major verticals we're targeting. As we get this toehold, as we begin to get the initial adopters and influencers, our expectation is we'll start to see a dramatic expansion in each of the other verticals. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> you've made some significant investments in your direct-to-consumer capabilities over the past uh, year or so, really. Um, talk about who is the customer here um, and provide some update <clears throat> on how the progress has gone. So a couple of things around direct-to-consumer. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, part of the, the original direct-to-consumer thrust was a recognition that, in some respects, our business is, you know, has an analog, believe it or not, in pharmaceuticals. And that is that in many cases, or in the case of pharmaceuticals, the end user, the person that's putting the drug in his or her mouth, is not the person that's making the decision to buy it. In that case, it's a physician it's an insurance company, it, it's a, a different decision maker. But the industry learned decades ago that one of the key ways to ultimately drive pull through to the person taking the pill was to advertise directly to them. And so originally, or the, the, the premise of our direct-to-consumer focus was awareness at the end user level of the need of the existence of contrapest and of the need for it. So they would begin to ask their pest management professionals, you know, the Orkins, the Terminexes, the, the Masseys of the world for the product, um, you know, as a pull through piece, but also creating the systems that, you know, whether it was an end user or whether it was an inter intermediary, a pest management professional, a PMP, they could buy directly from us to get, put some sort of price discipline in the market. So we spent a lot of time building out systems, uh, you know, both website, both our online shopping portal, uh, portals, um, contrapeststore.com, sinestec.com, so that we had the infrastructure for people to come and buy, but also that we had the mechanism, whether it was through our websites, whether it was through social, whether it was through advertising or otherwise, to create the awareness so that they knew that they could come to us to buy or they could ask their professional to buy. But the key piece of this thing in the process of creating the online store and, and creating the market, we found that not only was it the PMPs that are coming to us or the distributors coming to us, but we have a fair number of, of individuals coming to buy. And um, you know, it's homeowners, it's people that have you know, small farms, again, they're people that have horses and other things, but they are people, you know, particularly ones that are coming to us directly that are highly sensitive to the environmental issues, that are concerned about having poison around their pets, around their kids. They're concerned about the, the effects on, uh, on wildlife in surrounding areas. 
So, I mean, it, it skews to people that are somewhat more environmentally aware. And one of the interesting pieces that, you know, at least we've seen anecdotally, is it skews towards women. And, uh, you know, which, you know, makes some degree of sense in that, you know, when it's concerned about, you know, pets and kids, et cetera, it's the people that are more likely to be, be in the home, all right? Other piece of this is as more and more people are spending time at home, particularly because of COVID, uh, we're finding that there's a greater level of sensitivity around rodent and other issues. And so I think that's another thing that's, that's driving additional attraction to the website because people are now seeing rats in their areas uh, and are looking for solutions that are both effective and environmentally sustainable. You talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but maybe expand to the extent you know you can about the competitive landscape for <clears throat> Contrapass, right? You know who and or what do you view <clears throat> as your primary competitor? Um, there's obviously no direct competitor. Uh, we are the only registered, or EPA registered, uh, rodent or you know rat contraceptive. And so anything else is you know, in the space of, uh, of other rodent control, whether it's the poisons or it's traps or it's, you know, exclusion technologies, et cetera. The thing though that we've attempted to do, Robert, is because we deal with an aspect of rodent control that nobody else is dealing with, and that's reproduction, we're positioning ourselves not as a competitor of these other products, but potentially as an adjunct. And so essentially it's, you can certainly use us to the exclusion of other things, but anything that you use, if you use it in combination with ContraPest, it's gonna be much more effective. So part of this is no real direct competitor. And we're attempting to turn those, you know, indirect competitors actually into allies because we can make them work better. You mentioned a couple of names a moment ago, um, <clears throat> pest management professionals, or what you know, right. find as PMPs, right? Right. Are the larger ones beginning to take notice. Talk about what the that that relationship <clears throat> is there. Interesting. Um, I will tell you that you know when we first started out on this thing, um, the the larger players were actually resistant. Um, and part of this is because they view us as potentially changing or disrupting their business model. And part of that is because the product works. And a lot of their business model is built off of, you know, this boom and bust. You knock the population down, it comes back, you come back out again, you redeploy. And what we've been working to make sure they understand is because Contrapest is a contraceptive. It's not a sterilant. It needs to be continuously deployed for maximum effect. So if they put it into their, their protocols, it actually fits very well. It actually create, it reduces the population, keeps it down, enhances customer satisfaction, and makes their servicing requirements more predictable. <clears throat> you know, put that aside. I mean, what started to happen though, particularly when you see the initiatives like the change in law in California, some of the things that are now being discussed on the East Coast, some of the more enlightened of the larger players now realize that they need a tool like ContraPest in their toolkit. And we are starting to see penetration with at least two of the majors who are, you know, have gone from, you know, you know, talking about us at some point in the future to now actively working with us on projects. And the expectation is that as we demonstrate success with those, we'll continue to expand within their areas and the other players, you know, it's a me too type of environment. We expect they'll follow suit, but if they don't, they're gonna be left behind by the more enlightened players. When you land a large <clears throat> contract of some sort, whether it be with a PMP um, or, or just a, a customer directly, um, how does that process work? Do they, do they order in advance? Uh, is it a subscription model, an ongoing subscription model? What, what does that look like? Tom, you want to take that? You're the one that monitors the, the sales more regularly than, even than I do. Sure. So, you know, the it is 
some do, some some don't. But most of the time, when a large contract, a PMP or somebody like that, uh, signs up for something, they almost always want to try it for themselves. Uh, and the other piece is that PMPs and customers as well don't like to carry inventory. So we don't tend to see any kind of what we would call stocking orders. What we see is an initial order as they try it out in one place. And maybe it's one customer for a PMP or it's one location for uh, an end user. Uh, and then as they begin to get experience with it, understanding how to deploy it, how to, how to replace it, et cetera, they begin to expand either to other areas, other barns within a farm, for example, or other customers. Then we see that the, the ramp up in, in, those, uh, in those purchases from those customers. So it tends to be a gradual thing, but everybody wants to try it out a little bit to see how it fits in their particular environment in their particular business. All right, I know we're getting close to the end. I just want to hit on maybe one or two additional topics here. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the filing of, a, of an S3 shelf. Um, in line investors, you know, should we be expecting some sort of a dilutive event here soon? Again, turn it to my CFO. <laughs> so no, a, a shelf <clears throat> registration or a registration of securities <clears throat> on form S3 is really intended to be a standby facility that can be used for up to three years. Uh, we had one in place uh, that we put in place three years ago. Uh, we used it occasionally and selectively, uh, and we would anticipate to potentially use it here uh, in selectively and, and as conditions warrant over the next three years. There's no real signal value as to a dilutive event or any sort of financing. We will continue to be very opportunistic and also very mm -hmm. aware of the impact of any financing uh, on the existing shareholders. All right. Well, I know we're getting here uh, at the end, you know, maybe to wrap things up a little bit, you know, what are some of the key milestones that we should be looking at or investors should be looking at in 2022? And if we all got together here again in 12 months and we looked back, what are some of the biggest risks you see ahead of you to achieve some of those goals? Let me let me start on that one, and then Tom obviously helped me. So, you know, for us, particularly in 2022, Robert, um, the milestone is revenue, and we've gone from pre-commercial to building the commercialization capabilities in 2021 to launching our awareness and marketing campaigns. You know, one of the things that we saw, you know, through 2021, actually probably going back to 2020, is We've been able to, to generate, you know, year over year, quarter over quarter, or year over year quarterly growth of 2x. And, you know, as Tom and I have been talking about it, the 2x has become sort of the floor from our expectations. And we don't, you know, the, the expectation is that should continue to expand in 2022. You know, we, we can't predict the point in time at which we bend the curve. And we tend to view this thing, you know, given that it's a disruptor, at, there will come a point in time in which this will go from 2x to some multiple of 2x. But that's what, uh, you know, people should be looking at from a milestone. We need to deliver revenue in, uh, in 2022, and we need to begin to show expansion of our, of our year over year growth. Um, you know, the risk to that, you know, if we put together, you know, if we get rid of, you know, the, the socioeconomic risk, I mean, obviously we're, we're operating in a, in a bit of a funky world between Omicron and supply chain and various other pieces. Um, you know, the risk is really on our heads from an execution standpoint. And I think we have actually put in place all of the teams, all of the infrastructure we need to, ex to execute on this plan. So, you know, if we're sitting here, you know, next December, you know, and we haven't, uh, you know, solidly delivered on the 2X, and if not expanded on the 2X, then uh, we'd be disappointed. But I think, you know, looking down at the square below me and my CFO to see if he's smiling at this point in time, I think we're confident that, uh, you know, we're going to be, you know, together next year, and we're going to be looking, you know, as though, you know, we delivered on what we said we were going to do. 
Fantastic. Well, look, anything else that uh, we want folks to take away from the discussion? I know we're kind of closing down on the end of the time. Um, you know, again, I, this is our time. Uh, you know, as I, as, I, as I just said, we have put in place, it's taken us multiple years, the pieces that are necessary to make Synestec and ContraPest a success. We have the data, finally, to support the claims that have been made. We have a product that works, that's highly effective, that plays into the current dynamics in the world. It's sustainable. It is less toxic. Uh, it's not going to harm children and pets, et cetera. And interestingly, in, you know, in, in that particular area, not only can we make all those claims, but we have a product that works better than existing products. So 2022 should be a positive year for Synestec, and we look forward to talking to you about it again next summer. Fantastic. Sounds good. Well, we'll leave it there. Uh, Ken, Tom, thank you very much for your time today. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, again, I'll put a reminder out there to anyone that has not already signed up for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, again, send me an email, bloom, B-L-U-M, at lithumpartners.com, or again, visit the website, lithumpartners.com forward slash virtual. Click on the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. Uh, we hope you all enjoy the conference. Ken, Tom, thank you again very much. Thanks, Robert.